We came upon the stretch of road with fields on both sides and an irrigation ditch running parallel to it. I looked out my window and saw him, a melon head. He, or it, was running next to the ditch. We were going about 45 or 50 miles per hour, and the melon head was actually keeping up with us. Tony's account, as published in Weird U.S., Your Travel Guide to America's Local Legends and Best Kept Secrets, by Mark Moran and Mark Scourman. There are many creatures that exist in folklore, but the ones who seem to capture the imagination more than any other are the ones that look human. This fascination with monstrous humanoids is only natural. These beings look like us in a sense, but are actually far from human. In the states of Michigan, Ohio, and Connecticut, humanoid creatures of unknown origin have been reported. These beings have one truly defining feature, oversized bulbous heads. The origin of these creatures are unknown, and there are many theories attempting to explain their existence. Are they human, or are they something completely separate? Tonight, we take a look at these legends and break open the melon head mystery on this episode of Snipe Hunt. Welcome to Snipe Hunt, your frightening folklore podcast. I am your host, Gary Clevenstein. And I am your other host, Darren Young. And we have an interesting topic today. The very first patron voted topic, the melon heads. All right. Now, tonight's subject sounds similar to those who suffer from hydrocephalus, which is a disorder characterized by an accumulation of cerebral spinal fluid within the brain. This can occur due to birth defects. And in babies, this can cause a rapid increase in head size. So when we refer to melon heads in this episode, we are referring to the cryptid described by witnesses and the folklore of the region. (laughs) That was my mom's talk. Um, Although one of the working theories is that these are humans suffering from hydrocephalus, we are by no means demeaning or making fun of victims of this condition. But before we go any further, we have a new review, Darren. From iTunes, a five-star review from uh, Agia. Agia. Found uh, titled "Found from MAU." Is that meow? Meow. Just, no, well, keep reading. You'll find out what it is. Oh. <laughs> keep up the good work. Found this pod from Monsters Among Us. One of the hosts had a call, and it was intriguing to me. Nice. That was yeah, you, Darren. Yeah, yeah. That was you. Pat on the back, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. I did. I did call <laughs> in. I was about to say, for, for those who don't know, I did call in a story of um, an experience my dad had to the Monsters Among Its podcast, and that's what he was referring to. And uh, another five star review from Carpru, who says, Funny and down to earth. This is such a good podcast. Both of the hosts for, work very well together. It's witty, and I found myself laughing out loud a few times. Which can be a little awkward when you start laughing for seemingly no reason at work. I agree. I do it all the time. Absolutely. (laughs) I love the guy's theories and how easy they can rationalize the strangest anomalies. P.S. I also became really excited when I found out they're from Northwest Arkansas. I'm also a Northwest Arkansas native, and I feel less alone, weird, knowing someone else is around and thinks and talks about these types of stories. Yeah, I'll be honest. I never thought of this stuff really until Darren came along and... Yeah, I kind of opened the door for him. And I, he, yeah, he's like, I'm going to start a podcast. And I'm like, I am too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, hey, Gary, I'm starting a podcast. Gary's like, can I be in? I was like, I haven't told you anything yeah. about the podcast yet. <laughs> I'm like, I don't but, care. But thanks, Carpru. I was <laughs> I was always under the impression that we weren't funny and more on the annoying side. Yeah. So I, this has been my favorite review because, you know. And, you know, we're still learning. And um, yeah, absolutely. You know, get better and better as time goes. I have a feeling I'm already starting to feel a lot more comfortable doing this. Um, so, yeah, hopefully things get a lot better and uh, we can keep you yeah, entertained. Absolutely. And it, it's pretty cool that you're also a Northwest Arkansas native. I don't know if you saw this recently in the news, but uh, one of the big survey study things uh, found that they tested 125 different places, um, metropolitan area, areas, and out of 125, Fayetteville, Arkansas is number four of the best places to live in the United States. And I can't 
disagree more. But you know, <laughs> hey, you don't even live in Fayetteville. You I, I know. I can't stand Vista. even going to Fayetteville. Fayetteville That's what I'm saying. The best. I can't imagine living in it. We're in Fayetteville right now. I know. Well, and I love it. You're right. Well, I mean, this is. I don't. I don't consider this Fayetteville. Really, what do you consider Fayetteville? I think of college, college, and Dixon. And what's wrong with that? Oh, it's awful. No, it's not. Yeah, it's I many, Uber there all the time. Too many it's people. Fine. Too many people causing too many problems. <laughs> exactly. Land of confusion. Whoa, whoa. All right, enough of that. Okay. So we also have a Facebook recommendation, which I would like to share from Addie Lloyd. She says, "Very entertaining." Right up my foggy dark alley. And if I'm if I'm thinking correctly, Addie, she's from the monsters. Yes, among I really them. appreciate this recommendation yeah. specifically. I appreciate all of them, but this one specifically because Addie runs the official Monsters Among Us fan page. So it's awesome to get a review from someone from another awesome paranormal podcast. So definitely go check out Monsters Among Us if you aren't already. Me and Gary, uh, before that we got started on this, we <laughs> we were having all kinds of issues. I'm dog sitting for my mom right now. And when Gary got here and we opened the door, that dog got out and we just got done chasing it Yeah, it was all around the times. neighborhood. It was pretty awful. I was half awake. I just woke up from a nap. And he was grumpy. And, and I was, was like, this grumpy. is not going to go Still good. So kind of am. So we, we got the dog. So worry not. But then we got back and I was like, oh, I downloaded this new audio stuff. <laughs> it's going to make our podcast sound great. And then it just messed everything up. So I had to go back to the other one. Poor Gary had to sit there for like 45 minutes while I worked on this. So I'm a patient human being, though. All right. Enough complaining. I'm, I'm, let's get on with it. All right. Uh, but before we do, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this topic was the winner of the topic voting poll on Patreon.com. So if you'd like to vote for a topic for future episodes, as well as access to other goodies, you can become a patron today at Patreon.com slash Snipe Hunt for as little as $1 a month. All donations are very much appreciated. Very much. Uh, as mentioned in the Hoya by Chu minisode, I apologize for the audio in episode 11. My microphone picked up the output from the headphones around my neck, and I'll make sure not to repeat this mistake. The it was still a really good episode, though. Yeah, it was. I was really, it was, it was really, really good episode. happy. I mean, I thought so it sounded. If you haven't right. listened to it yet, I recommend you do. It's not the audio is not so bad where it distracts, but but Darren, also, what? as of a few weeks ago, yeah, we broke a thousand downloads. What, Hana? Are you serious? This isn't a very big milestone for most podcasts, but we're but we're super excited because it's just it just means that we're getting better. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> we would like to thank you, dear listeners, for taking the time to tune in. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, we hope to break this milestone many times over, and then many times over again. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Let's get into it. All right, all right. So I'm kind of excited about this. I just. I saw the uh, the topic uh, headline and I was like, we got to do this one because it, it, it does go a lot deeper than I originally thought. So it's definitely going to be a good episode. <laughs> I told my dad. I was talking to my dad on yeah. the phone earlier. <laughs> He's like, "What is your episode?" I said, "I'm on my way to <laughs> mail and heads." Yeah, yeah. I said, I said, uh, I said, it, was it wrong when I said Michigan melon heads? Kind of. Well, they're in more places than just Michigan. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I said I said. Oh, but Michigan well, melon has just, it just goes. Together it goes so together. Well. Yeah. And I was like, hey, I have Dad. to think up of a new name for this episode now. <laughs> I said, I said, oh, <laughs> we're doing one on the Michigan melon heads, and he and he laughed. He goes, he goes, hey, is that that one where the the uh, this guy was driving along and he looked into this watermelon field and this guy was going to town on some watermelons. <laughs> 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 Man, we do need to do that episode. I was like, um, no, Dad, this is now, this is about you know folklore and creatures that. Now, now I'm curious. <laughs> I know because so it's like he like he couldn't even take a watermelon home. He right. had to. He was doing it in the field, <laughs> right there in the field. <laughs> what? They were beautiful melons. <laughs> I, well, I would hope so. <laughs> but, so. First things first. Okay, okay. Real melon heads yes. this time. What is a melon head? Mysteriousuniverse.org provides a colorful description. I'm just, I can't get the <laughs> yeah, mental I image know, out of my head now. <laughs> These creatures are said to look more or less human, but with a sickly pallor and enormous, almost comically oversized cranium. 
often also mentioned as possessing sharp, shark-like teeth that sit atop their slight, emaciated frames, and they wander about the forest, surprising motorists, startling hikers, and sometimes downright terrifying people with their nightmarish visage. So think Golem from Lord of the Rings, but with just like a giant head, basically. Ah. Yeah. Okay, anyway, sorry. Um, they often shy away and try to stay out of sight, but can and will attack if anyone gets too close. They are feral creatures that only come out at night to hunt or scavenge for food and are often blamed for mutilated bodies of animals that are found in the woods. The Melonhead legend in Michigan is tied to the Felt Mansion. So we get a little history here, mm-hmm. a little context to surround... A little timeline. Yeah. Uh, The Felt Mansion was built in 1928 by Dorfelt, a prominent industrialist, as a summer house. The classical revival mansion is located in Lake Lake Town Township. It's kind of redundant. uh, Michigan, and is very close to Lake Michigan. In August of 1928, Felt's wife suddenly died only six weeks after the family had moved in. Dorfelt quickly remarried and the very next year lived in the mansion until his death in Chicago in 1930. Oh, that happened all, f- that all pretty fast, huh? So I, Within I thought two that years. was kind of weird because cause he he built the mansion. It mm-hmm. was pretty much for her. But then when she died, he married like literally the next year. Like he um, waited a few months. Immediate. Was it murder? And then two dun, years dun, later, dun, he's dun. dead, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he dies. What a way to go. <laughs> yeah. Everyone dies the end. Um, the mansion was left to the Felt children until it was sold in 1949 to the Chicago province of the Augustian Order of the Catholic Church. The mansion then became the St. Augustine Catholic Seminary Prep School later that year. The school housed priests as well as students in grades 9 through 12. Uh, the mansion was then purchased by the state of Michigan in 1977, who converted the building into the Sagatuck Dunes Correctional Facility. Man, all these names are kind of tongue twisty. <laughs> Uh, the prison was closed in 1991 and the estate was sold to Lake Town Township in 1995 for $1. What a deal. On the condition that the mansion was preserved and it be owned by the public. In 1996, the property was added to the National Register of Historic Places and it is still owned by the city to this day. I honestly was expecting it to become the Xavier School for the Gifted. Yeah, right? Or to- <laughs> I couldn't maybe, remember the name of it though. Maybe like, in another time. I was going to crack that joke, but I, I, I was like, wait a minute, what is it called? It's okay. Is it the Xavier School? For... <laughs> is it, uh, uh, hold on. Yeah. Time out. <laughs> Let me Google this real quick. But I, I really like this because I like big buildings with a storied history, especially right now because it really reminds me of the Crescent Hotel. Right. Which... Well, I mean, it's just nuts though because it, it was so fast. Like, it, it was built in 28. Right. And then by 1930, they're dead. Yep. And then by 1949, it's already selling. Yeah. I mean, normally when when you build a house, I mean, for the most part, people are usually in them for, you know, you own right, them for yeah. years and but, years and years. But like it seemed like this was just quick. Yeah. Maybe it was built on cursed land. No, I'm just Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's but, true. Because what the... the the uh, Aug- Augustinian order, yeah, had it the only Catholic for twenty seven years. Yeah, you know, twenty twenty seven years, something like that. What is it with with Catholic schools and just buying up old buildings to use? Because they did that at the Crescent Hotel too. Oh, did they? Yeah, it was the it was the women's it was the women's prep school. There. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll we'll cover more on that once we you know uh, they probably get them at really cheap prices. Yes. Yeah, but not as good of a, as as a price as the uh, the Lake Town Township. Yeah, that was one dollar for a dollar. One dollar. Yeah, I think I think that was just more of a ceremonial gesture. Like legally, they had to sell it for a certain amount of money. Right. But they really just wanted to give it away. But there's a mansion in Rogers. Yeah. That uh, used to be a business retreat where they send executives to to learn to you know to I don't know exactly what it did. It was just it was a retreat the deal for by Donald to, Trump. Kind of yeah yeah but. Um, if somebody sold that to me for a dollar, which I would take it because yeah, it's beautiful absolutely. for a dollar on my salary, I couldn't even <laughs> afford it. To even if it was it. given to me, yeah, yes. right. I couldn't maintain Just it. I couldn't bills. pay the utilities. 
I, I mean, they have a 3,000 gallon propane tank. Well, I mean, that's why run. they're selling it to a government body as opposed to yeah. one individual. That's probably why the children sold it in the first place. <laughs> but, uh, all, right, all right, moving yes. on. A woman named Kelly Top Bed- Bedrosian, 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 yes, tells her experience in the book Weird Michigan. I used to go to the Felt Mansion in Saugatuck at night with friends when I was in high school. The building back then was abandoned and falling apart. One night, while my friends and I were exploring the grounds, we heard something rustling in the woods. I tried to just brush it off as a deer or maybe a fat raccoon, but a man with what appeared to be an overly sized head emerged from the woods about 50 yards away and saying nothing started walking towards us it's an so what's the dip what is a, a, ra- a regular raccoon and a fat raccoon sound like like i'm just wondering. yeah yeah maybe she just i thought that was a kind of shallow thing to say but i think it just sounded heavier than a regular right. raccoon i guess <laughs> but yeah just assume the raccoon's fat yeah <laughs> it's kind of rude Not knowing who this man could be, my friend yelled, Hello! to try and be friendly. But all we got was a loud grunt, and the man continued to walk towards us, but now at a faster pace. At this point, the same idea hit hit all of us, and we started sprinting towards our car. We scrambled in and peeled out of the parking lot at full speed, not slowing down until we were several miles from the mansion. We all settled down and we started to laugh at how we must have overreacted, nervously hoping that it was just a neighbor or possibly a night watchman. Several days later, I told the story to my dad and he suddenly got very serious. He told me that I was never to go back to the Felt Mansion at night. When I asked him why, he told me the story of the Melonheads. Years ago, the Felt family sold the mansion to a seminary and a small insane asylum was built on the grounds. It was then sold to the state of Michigan, and the state turned it into a low-security prison. My father told me that the asylum specialized in patients with extra fluid in the brain, causing their heads to swell. After funding for the asylum was cut, most of the patients were set free, quote-unquote. Many of the melon heads had already developed an intense hatred for normal-looking people and chose to stay on the grounds away from society, and they built homes out of the tunnels that ran under the mansion. Supposedly, they continued to live there and interbreed for decades and still live there to this day. I don't know if the man we saw was a melon head, but after I heard the story, I never went back there at night again. P.S. The Felt Mansion had recently been restored and now offers tours to the public. The mansion is located within the Sagatuck State Park and is well worth seeing. Also, Agnes Felt, for whom the house was built, died there three days after it was finished, and it is said that she haunts the place to this day. Okay, so a couple of things. Um, as far as the history of the Felt Mansion, that part she mentions, that's all correct. Mm-hmm. But, like, the parts where it was abandoned there was only like a couple of five year stretches where it was wasn't being used by anyone at the time and she doesn't specifically say in this story what year it was well i love how she's like i never went back there again at night yeah. but now but now it's fun. yeah now go back yeah. there you gotta visit it's beautiful oh, it's gorgeous yeah. <laughs> gorgeous highly recommend it and so According to her dad, uh, the seminary was, it was purchased it, and then they built an insane asylum on the grounds. Uh, last I checked, and recently, I don't do. The, does the Catholic Church have anything to do with treating mental disorders? Because I don't know. Because that's the weird. Catholic Church. They're the ones who do the the exorcism and stuff too, aren't they? Or no? Yeah, but oh, yeah. the the actual actually the process of sending a priest out for an exorcism uh-huh. is very long and strenuous because they are aware of mental disorders mm-hmm. and they will only go out there after a long investigation that determines and like multiple levels of approval. So it's like a whole legit thing. It's not like, Hey, father, Bob, <laughs> my daughter's possessed. You'd be like, Oh, okay. I'll be out there. Tonight. Uh, it's yeah, not like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like that. Multiple levels of approval. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I don't think they run any asylums. So, mm-hmm. but you know, that was just my, Initial thoughts about the stories, if you would like to yeah. continue. 
Now, the asylum she mentioned was, according to legend, the Junction Insane Asylum, but the, the Allegan County Historical Society has stated that the asylum never existed. Another version of the Michigan legend states that the afflicted children lived in the mansion itself, but escaped and took up residence in nearby caves. Yet other versions say that the children killed the doctor who abused them and cut up the body and hid the pieces throughout the mansion. According to rumors, teenagers who have broken into the mansion during the years, um, it was not. It was not in use. Yeah, saw ghosts of children and strange shadows coming from a ghostly light in an open doorway. So this is this is a pattern that we're going to see throughout the rest of this episode. Is that there are multiple versions of even the same story? Like all these, all this involves melonheads in the felt mansion, but how? they relate and how they interconnect is all different according to who you ask. You know what I'm curious about is if this building is still standing. Yes, it is. Okay. I wonder if they do the same thing that like Crescent Hotel does, you know. The tours? Ghost tours. Yeah. 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 You know, because then it'd be like, wait a minute, I'd start researching more of different places and and wonder if right. it's just a, you know, a thing that these places do. They build up these stories. Well, I mean... I think we talked about this before, but I mean, if I own a haunted a hotel and people and guests were telling me that it was haunted, right? Why not monetize that? There's right. no, there's no shame in doing that, right? I mean, now if you're making it up for the sake of business, then it's a problem. But I think haunted places. I think that's what a lot of skeptics will say. They'd be like, "Oh, they're just making this up to drum up business." Mm-hmm. It's like, well. Maybe it's actually haunted, and they're maybe just, they're just taking advantage right. of the fact that they own a haunted building. Or maybe it, it, they may think that it's made up too. But when you got people coming at you saying, you know, yeah. giving you stories, well, then Absolutely. shoot, why not use them? You know. But I mean, nothing I found like the felt mansion about ghosts and stuff. Just it's, it's all just seems to be rumor. I don't find any corroborating evidence. I, I couldn't find any witnesses to said ghosts or you know melon heads other than the lady whose story we just read, but right. anyway. All right. But the melon head mania is actually most prevalent in Ohio. Legend says that the melon heads can be sighted along uh, Wis- Weisner, Weisner, uh, can be sighted along Weisner Road in Kirk- Kirkland. God, weird names. I don't know. <laughs> My mouth just doesn't want to work with me today. And in Chardon Township. Here's an excerpt from weirdus.com that explains the legend. The popular belief is that they were the result of secret government testing that involved strange experiments on human subjects. Whatever they were testing, the result was the subjects' heads all swelled up to enormous sizes. Like any good government conspiracy, it was decided that the best thing to do would be to cover up the whole thing. This um, is making me curious about my own head, though. I have a gargantuan head, dude. It's, yeah. I mean, I'm a big man. But like oh, literally, good, I, good, I, can't, I can't even wear hats. It's that bad. <laughs> I thought maybe getting well, a haircut would fix it, but it doesn't. It's not like your head is disproportionate to your body, dude. If you and I took a picture together, if somebody, yeah. if, if Susan took a picture of us, I would look like I was five feet in front of you, like towards <laughs> the camera. You do have kind of a big head. I but, just huge. Yeah, but, I mean, it's fine. It's not like it's not like you have, you know. I'm an Ozark melon head. You got, you got a big frame too, so it's not it all goes together. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, a secret location in the middle of the woods was quickly established, and the melon heads were all shipped there in the middle of the night. Since they were all well taken care of, the melon heads were, for the most part, a passive bunch. However, every once in a while, one of them would grow restless for contact with the outside world. Usually, waiting until the cover of darkness. A melon head or two would every so often slip outside their little commune and creep through the woods toward civilization. More often than not, just a glimpse of the outside world would be all a melon head would need to send them scampering back to the safety of their little town, which is said to be somewhere in the woods near Weisner Road. There are a few offshoots of the melon head legend in which a doctor is featured prominently. In those versions, the doctor's name is Crow. C-R-O-E, or Crow, just the regular spelling of Crow. In the first version, Dr. Crow has somehow managed to acquire, either by kidnapping or through a secret deal with mental hospital he works at, several individuals that he subjects to bizarre experiments, most of which focus on the brain and head. Due to severe trauma, the individual's heads are deformed and misshapen. 
but since some of Dr. Crow's experiments also included lobotomies, the melon heads are rather docile, if not a bit slow. Lobotomy, is that where the, that's where they... That's where they ice pick your brain through the, your eyeball socket. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, right? It's very inhumane. Um, so every once in a while, Dr. Crow would, quote-unquote, lose a subject for a short period of time. He would always be able to round it up rather quickly and return them. So in this version, rather than the melonheads being born deformed, they're the result of experimentation, as in they were at some point relatively normal until Dr. Crow got a hold of them. Yeah, he started messing around. I wonder if he had to have them sign some sort of paper before he goes picking on their heads. I'm sure not in those days. <laughs> Well, it's really not that long ago, is it? Is that... Well, there's not a specific year ever mentioned in any of these legends, no. but we can assume that it was long ago when mental institutions were the worst places on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> there are some other variations of the Dr. Crow story. Yeah. Of course there are. Who was the, who was the, the doctor from the Crescent? I don't remember. Dr. Norman Baker. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Norman yeah. Baker, yeah. A.K.A. The Ass. Yeah. <laughs> One of them being that Dr. Crow and his wife both care, cared for a, a few hydrocephiac. I think it's hydrocephalic. Cephalic? Cephalic, because it's hydrocephalus. Hydrocep. Okay. All right. I'll go with that. Yeah, go with that. <laughs> and that the children grew especially close to Mrs. Crow and even regarded her as their mother. But Mrs. Crow passed away. And this event caused the children to panic and run wildly around the house. Dr. Crow tried to calm them down and even physically restrain them, and that in the scuffle, the children knocked over a kerosene lamp which set the house ablaze. The fire burned quickly and engulfed the house and everyone in it. This story indi in indicated that the melon heads seen in the area are the ghosts of these children. So now we don't just have melon head creatures, we have ghost melon head creatures. <laughs> Oh, you know, I honestly think this is the most bizarre one we've ever talked You're about. You're right. There's just so many different offshoots. Right. But that's how that's it's how not coming together. Works. Yeah. I mean, you ask one person one thing, it's this. If you ask another person the same thing, it's yeah. totally different. <laughs> there is one final variation on the Dr. Crow legend. This one is definitely the most disturbing. This one goes that Dr. Crow performed illegal abortions in his house in the woods and would not be above killing a deformed baby after they were born. He would then bury the corpses around the hill near his cabin. It is said that the basement of the doctor's abandoned house, you could still hear the disembodied cries of the babies. Because of this, the bridge on Wisner Road near the cabin is a known crybaby bridge. And a crybaby bridge is exactly how it sounds. It's a bridge where you can hear the cries of children. And I guess in this variation of the legend, the melon heads in this case would also. This be one sounds ghosts. the most believable. Definitely sounds the most believable. Um, it's not as uh, crazy as the other ones, but honestly, out of all of them, I hope this one's the. Uh, how do you advertise? Least for that? likely one. Uh, you know, how, how do you advertise for selling drugs? Hey, ma'am, I see you're <laughs> pregnant. I see you have a deformed baby. Yeah. <laughs> Mind if I murder it? Yeah. <laughs> like, how do you? But surely there wasn't. I mean, it's the same way you advertise any illegal activity, I guess. Oh, so this is this is yeah. postnatal. Like sometimes they bring the baby to him. Yeah, that's why I read in the paragraph. Were you not listening? I I guess not. no. I just said <laughs> I just see that he performed well, illegal abortions. He said he performed abortions, but also would not be above killing a deformed baby after they after were it okay. Was born. All right. All yeah. Right. Yeah. So that right brings me back to my original question: uh, Is like, how do you advertise for that? The same way you advertise any criminal activity, I guess. Yeah. You don't take out ads in the <laughs> newspaper, yeah. basically. Come on down to Dr. Crow's <laughs> abortion clinic. We are located in the woods. <laughs> uh, so I also want to mention that there's no evidence that a Dr. Crow ever existed, thankfully. Mm. Um, the encounter briefly mentioned in the cold opening of this episode allegedly happened in Ohio. Here is the full story as published in Weird U.S., your travel guide to America's local legends and best kept secrets. My name is Tony, and I recently had an experience with the Melonheads. It was on October 5th, 2001. 
My stepfather, mom, stepbrother, and me were driving down Chilcothy Road in Shorten. We'd been driving up and down roads in the same area for almost an hour with no luck. We were just about to go home when we came up on the stretch of road that had fields on both sides and an irrigation ditch running parallel with each side of the road. Just then, I look out my window and I saw him. A melon head. He, or it, was running along next to the ditch. Since the ditch was way too wide to jump over, it was coming close, like it was about to jump, then pulling away. I don't know which one he was doing. <laughs> At the time, we were going about 45 to 50 miles per hour. The melon head was actually keeping up with us. Sucker was fast. Didn't look anything like I've heard in the stories. He looked about the same height as me. It's five seven, ladies. <laughs> he was wearing brown pants, which were, were very ripped up, and where the seams would be, it was held together by what looked like corn husks. He wore a white shirt with brown and red stains all over it. I was hoping that the red stains weren't blood. Its head was a very light brown tint had two holes in the sides of the head, which I think was ears. Its head was swelled up, but its eyes were very big looking. Just as we turned a curve, it jumped into the woods. And that's my story, the melon heads. My name's Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tony, for your encounter. Um, so this one is kind of interesting because um, other than, you know, the melon head, Running 45, 50 miles per yeah. hour. Um, Can you imagine? It's like a bobblehead. It didn't really have <laughs> ears on it. It had like two holes in the side of its head. And it had big big, big eyes. That's not. Big old eyes. <laughs> big, big old eyes. And uh, so this almost makes it seem like not human, right? Because no human can run that fast, no. obviously. Most humans have ears. <laughs> this was like I downhill. I should specify most, Yeah. <laughs> 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 so it's definitely an interesting story whether or not it's true is debatable but g good story to listen to espe yeah. especially when you do it in that voice <laughs> and add your little garyisms yeah not all of that was uh what was it verbatim what, it was verbatim yeah it wasn't verbatim yeah he added was, uh, some stuff here and there but what is that called like when it uh paraphrase paraphrase yeah yes. some of it was paraphrasing i paraphrased now a ton of weird crypto paranormal stuff happens in Ohio all the time. So this, this story doesn't really surprise me. You can pull a random monster out of a hat and there's a good chance that it was seen in Ohio. And if we did a creepy legends of Ohio series, it would be several episodes long or two hours at least. Yes. Three. Now we, we are probably going to do the Bridgewater triangle episode pretty soon, which is, just a whole cavalcade of weird crypto paranormal stuff and included in that. Is I, that like the, the Bermuda Triangle kind of thing? Well, it's they call it a triangle just of that, but it's not it's not the same thing. It's just instead of, you know, ships disappearing, it's just a whole bunch of weird creatures and UFOs and ghosts and and Ohio is included in that, I believe. Don't correct me if I'm wrong, but But Darren, now I want to go to Connecticut. All right. Let's go, go to go Connecticut. Connecticut. All right. The last stop on our weird melonhead tour is Connecticut, where they have their own version of the melonhead legend. These stories are centered in several communities in New Haven County and Fairfield County. Now, like in the other areas discussed, there are many different versions of the melonhead legend, but there is a Connecticut version that is different from all the others. This should be interesting. Ooh. This version asserts that a family that, that lived near Trumbull in Fairfield County, practiced witchcraft around the same time as the Salem witch trials. Ooh, interesting. This family was banned from the town, so they made their own settlement in the nearby forest. Later generations of this outcast family developed into melon heads due to inbreeding. Melon head sightings in this state are centered around Velvet Lane in Trimble, which is known colloquially. Colloquially. Yeah. Oh, look at you just spitting it out like it's nothing. <laughs> as Dracula Drive. Other stretches of wooded roads that are associated with the legend are some back roads in Monroe and Downs Road in Hampton. So Dracula Drive, um, 
I couldn't really find a reason why it was called that other than it was associated with the melon heads, but I don't know where you get Dracula and melon heads from, but, but this one's also interesting. So it kind of incorporates witchcraft into the legend, which never, never says it was directly tied to the creation of the melon heads. But I did think it was interesting because it says it was inbreeding. So very like wrong turn esque, but that's what I've been. I've been thinking of a uh, wrong turn or the hills have eyes. The hills have eyes. That was yeah. the other one I was trying to think of. So as far as the witchcraft claim goes, Trumbull did have its very own local witch who is buried in Gregory's Four Corners burial ground in Trumbull. Hannah Hovey was nicknamed by the locals Hannah Crana, and she used her reputation as a witch to terrify others with threats of curses. Hannah Crana is the name that was engraved on her headstone, which is suspiciously one of the most well-preserved graves at the site, despite being almost 150 years old. 160 years old. 160 years old. <laughs> I misread that. But this this kind of local legend is is the stuff I really like. Oh, she she's a witch and she's buried in the in the cemetery and outside of Trumbull. And, and how else are you gonna explain uh, it? But she has the cleanest headstone <laughs> out there. I did look at the headstone and you know it's it looks pretty good for being 160. Really? I'm not sure if it's people uh, it's if it's been restored recently or anything, but yeah. I just liked how she was like, well people think I'm a witch, I'm going to act like a witch. She's like, you better give me a discount on this <laughs> or I'm going to curse you. And then people would be scared and then she would laugh. Mm. And I think that's hilarious. Yeah. Um other cases of the melon heads are explored in Bob Curran's book the world's creepiest places. Dun, dun, dun. Here's an excerpt. The legend of the melon heads is a common one across several American states, but there are older references to them from England and Germany as well. In her folklore of Herefordshire, Herefordshire, I got the buttress that. of Windsor. English folklorist Mary Lethbarrow mentioned Leather in Borough. Leth Leather Leather Borough. Leather. Uh, Leather. I think it's Leather Borough. English, English name. <laughs> folklorist Mary Letherborough mentions an extended family of melon heads living ab- on the edge of a village of Risbury. She claims that they had large rounded heads, which were thought to be the result of inbreeding. So uh, I think that's one thing we have in common throughout yeah. all the stories. Is Almost, definitely well, not all of them, but most you, of them. Yes, all of them ancestry. involved breeding of some type to develop into the feral creatures that they are today. But they were known locally as weeble heads. <laughs> I like that one better. That is better. They were avoided by the general populace and mostly kept to themselves. Although generally, generally reclusive, they were not exceptionally hostile towards their neighbors. Another melon head family alleged living her, like, allegedly Another melon head family allegedly living near near Konzenberg in Bavaria, Germany in the mid 1800s were not so friendly and several murders were laid at their door although nothing was ever proven. They were just as reclusive as those in Risbury but tended to adopt a more aggressive attitude to those who came near them. Ooh, that was yes. Tough. That was tough. Okay, so these melon heads over in Europe, they don't seem like the feral creatures that we have over here in the States. They just seem like a family or two that just like lived like normally, but they would be reclusive most likely because But they, they were, were incest. Like they Well, those were the rumors. Uh these families were most likely mistreated by the general populace and were probably blamed for many things just because they were reclusive and deformed. So they looked different. They looked scary. So they assumed that so they were So obviously they're inbreeding. inbreeding murderers. Yeah. Obviously. And like it said, it's, they were blamed for a lot of murders, but obviously nothing was ever proven probably. Most likely because they weren't committing any of the murders. <laughs> they were just like a scapegoat. But uh, this blaming and mistreatment most likely led to uh, hatred of normal people, um, not only from these families. Well, they probably didn't hate them, but they, maybe some of them. But because in the Melonhead legend, all of them state that all the Melonheads have a hatred towards normal people, and this is probably where it came from. With actual families with hydrocephalus being basically outcast to the edge of society because they're deformed. 
So. I just think Melonhead is the least scary name. Well, actually, the least scary name is Weeblehead. <laughs> oh, Weeblehead, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I think that's a better name. So mm. another notable mention of Melonhead-like creatures are the Managishi, which are a race of little people in the folklore of the Cree First Nation tribe. Here is a short description from the, from, from the Managishi Wikipedia page. They are described as semi-humanoid, being six-fingered humans with very thin and lanky arms and legs, and big heads minus a nose. According to one Cree schema of the mythology, there are two humanoid races, one being the familiar human species, and the other being the little people, i.e. Managishi. These people are said to live between rocks and the rapids, one of their biggest delights, a completely non-heroic form of trickster behavior, is to crawl out of the rocks and capsize the canoes of people canoeing through the rapids, spinning them to their death. Hmm. So in this one, they are, in this legend, they are a totally separate race of basically proto-humans, minus a nose, and they sort of take on the role of a trickster entity and cause the deaths of people canoeing. Well, for a second, it made me raise an eyebrow at you, though. What was that? Because it started describing you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Until it said minus a nose. I'm yeah. like, oh, okay, you're not But, but yeah, not I have Managishi. six fingers and yeah. six toes and, and very lanky thin arms and, lanky and arms. big heads. and. <laughs> yep, that's me <laughs> to a T. So I thought this was super interesting because this, this legend has definitely has older roots than I thought. And it could go back to uh, just the disorder hydrocephalus but maybe it's something else okay so let's go through the theories and uh let me hear your thoughts on them all right so the first theory is the most mundane one i don't know you gotta get this one out of the way first so basically the first theory is that they're the shun victims of hydrocephalus what do you think about that do you think that's the most likely is case? that the std no we, we is describe- it syphilis Hydrocephalus. Syphilis. Not, so it's not syphilis. syphilis. Oh, it's cephalus. Ceph- it's probably like cephalus or something like that. But, no. you know, no, it's not syphilis. <laughs> so, what do you think of that theory? Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, I think it's the most likely out of all of them. I think it was basically just at real people that had were just deformed. And then a whole uh legends were Built just spun, that. spun off that because yeah. that's how folklore works really i mean but inbred feral humans yeah that's that's another theory um that could also be the case I, I that i definitely think that could have happened uh maybe somewhere once i don't think he'll explain all of it but i definitely think that's a good possibility for sure because that's it's not like that hasn't happened before right i mean i can't bring up any Specific I don't examples. Know anybody specifically yeah, I don't either. know any inbred feral humans, but, but... I heard <laughs> that it can cause deformities. I know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy. Um, the next and he likes one... his own sister, <laughs> and she got a big head. <laughs> um, so the next one is experiments gone wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, I personally don't think this one's very likely because no. you know, you know, not, this doesn't really happen. Usually, experiments gone wrong just involve death. <laughs> Um, so the next one, which is the Cree folklore one, a uh, totally separate race of creatures. So this one is interesting because the concept of a little people, quote unquote, being, you know, dwarves, goblins, elves, puckwudgies, gnomes, manageshi, what have dwarves. you. Yes, I think it's a dwarves. Oh. Dwarves. <laughs> uh, that's actually very prevalent across like a ton of different cultures, much like a certain big hairy guy we know. I don't think a separate race of creatures totally off the table. I mean, there have been previous uh, species of humans that have grown only to live like four feet tall. We have multiple examples of that yeah. in the fossil record. So I don't think that's, I don't think it's likely for more recent cases, but maybe the Cree, the original Cree legend was sent from that. So another one I want to point out is that these melon heads are very similar to in appearance in appearance to gray aliens and the famous Dover demon. Oh, so it's like the 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 
most commonly drawn alien is the, the ginormous head. Yes, the gray body. alien with the big old and head, the, the eyes, spindly yeah. body, big yeah, eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially that one uh, encounter by Tony where he said it didn't have ears, it had big eyes yeah. and okay. ran 45 miles an hour. Um, the other e. one being... No, not E.T. No. E.T. doesn't have a big bulbous. He has a weird head, but not a big bulbous no, one. That's true. Um, so it's also similar to the Dover Demon, which is, a, if you don't know, is a hairless creature with large eyes and a large head and a spindly body first seen in 1977 by a teenager named William Bartlett. And maybe we we'll talked do... about that, didn't we? Uh, no. I want to say we did. Well, maybe. We might have mentioned it. It's not, it hasn't been a subject, might not be, hmm. but uh, Cryptonaut Podcast, a uh, whole episode on it. it was really good. So my, one of my theories for the melon heads is especially from Tony's account is cause it was wearing clothes, but it was very like strung together clothes. Right. Yeah. Like even the seams of the pants were made what from what looked to be like corn husk. My theory is that they are great aliens, but they crash landed survived and were stranded here with no way of getting back home. And they were trying so to they just, a ride. So they just camped out in the woods. Mm-hmm. And then whenever a car drives by, they run along. Like, hey, Wait. Hey. <laughs> I can honestly say I, I, I am one of the ones who voted for this topic. Yes. And I, I think I'm regretting that. <laughs> why, why are you because regretting? this is not near, near as, how do I put it? Captivating. Yeah. You say it's not as captivating well, as I would have thought is, it would have been. There's not really anything real that you can tie it to. Right. Honestly, no it's real just real stories, you know. It's just word of mouth. There's just vague, vague descriptions of events that most likely didn't happen. I just had so many things when, whenever I saw that in the topic list, I was like, this one. Yeah. I mean, it sounds great. Melon heads. Especially this is with be... the working titles, Michigan Melon Heads almost sounds like a football team. Yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking yeah. so much. Sounds great. Well, there's like I said, there's not any really specific encounters other than the ones we mentioned. Who, who knows if they were real? But it basically boils down to we saw something one time. Right. And then that's it. <laughs> but, you know, that's a lot of these cryptos go. But as far as the melon heads, honestly, I think they're just products. Well, of I mean, folklore. with most cryptids, though, there's a lot more yeah. stuff. That's you know? well. On this podcast, I try to not to do. I try to do things that other podcasts haven't. Well, yeah, already we need done. to do. Yeah, we need to do that. Yeah, and for sure. M- Melon has being one of them, but this might very well be the reason why. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody talks it's just, about them. <laughs> it's just a whole bunch of different things just thrown just, together. I don't know. It's very ramshackle anytime I, legends. Anytime I think of Melonhead, I'm just seeing the uh, the bobblehead in the on the dash of the well, car. Now, thanks to your dad, I'm just imagining the guy oh, on the yeah, fields going to man. town on some melons. <laughs> going to town on some watermelons. <laughs> oh God. Oh, but, but I guess that will do it for this episode of That'll Snipe Hunt. Please rate and review us on iTunes and or Apple Podcasts or whatever else. What is this? <laughs> Okay, I get it. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> what is this? What is this? What's happening? Where am I? <laughs> What's happening right now? Did I just have a stroke? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me... Please rate and review us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or whatever else will let you leave a review. I, I specify just between... Just review, please. I specify between iTunes and Apple Podcasts because apparently they're different. They don't seem all Well, different. yeah, well, on your iPhone you have... Yeah. A podcast app, app. called right. apple podcast right and it's then weird. there and then there's you know podbean and all that so uh just wherever you can review us please do yes. it this uh this helps sh- uh show more than anything it helps the show it helps yes yes it helps the show more than anything and we are all too happy to read it on the air yes and also please follow us on social media we'd love to hear from you uh, if you have a topic you'd like us to do, a question, comment, or curse, Ooh. <laughs> Hannah Karana, uh, or if you have a story that you'd like us to share our, on our encounter series, please contact us on social media or email us at snipehuntpodcast at gmail.com. From insane asylums to tricksters in the river, the legend of the melon heads is vast and well known to locals. Deciding whether or not these creatures exist or used to exist is up to you, dear listener. But whatever you choose, 
just be wary. If you find yourself in the wilds of Michigan, Ohio, or Connecticut, because they're in the woods, <laughs> there might just be lurking a spindly, feral creature with a large head watching you with a hateful stare. And you might become part of the melon heads frightening folklore. Once again, we want to thank you for listening to Snipe Hunt. Your listening has been noted and will be reported to the proper authorities. All audio used was done so under the protection of fair use. Logo design is by Ethan Rothfuss. The music used for this episode was composed by Mayu and Nature World 1986. We'll continue to search for the unexplained and we'll hopefully see you on the next hunt.